So tonight, I, it's my, my, my pleasure, good honor, and my joy to welcome up one of my closest friends, co-founded this ministry with me um, six years ago, and we've been running together, Father Matthias Thalen. Father Matthias, as you know, he's the, pr the pastor of St. Patrick's, our home here, and he's the president of Encounter Ministries, and I'm going to read some other cool things about him. He's both a graduate of St. John Vianney College Seminary and the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he earned a both de degrees in both philosophy and Catholic studies. He attended Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit um, under Dr. Mary Healy, who's here right now. Hey, Dr. Mary Healy. Coming, coming to, to learn from her former student. I love it. Um, <laughs> he was ordained a priest on June 11, 2010 for the Diocese of Lansing. He served several parishes before joining the faculty of Sacred Heart as a spiritual director and assistant professor of theology. In 2016, Father Thalen earned his licentiate in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. He is the author of the book, Biblical Foundations for the Role of Healing and Evangelization, and has appeared in the documentaries Fearless and Revive. Father Matthias is passionate to see the church come alive with the fullness of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit so that the world might believe in Jesus, the Son of God. Let's welcome Father Matthias Thalen. Amen. Amen. Um, so I want to be bold tonight. I'm going to attempt to do something that I think is kind of crazy, but I'm going to talk about a very complex and sensitive topic. And that's the topic of how to grow in trust of God. How to grow in our ability to trust him. It's, this is complex because it, it touches on our image of God, who we believe him to be, how we see ourselves in light of him, who is it that he's revealed us to be, and what we can expect in the relationship that we have with him. In fact, I would venture to say that our understanding of who God is and what he's revealed to us has everything to do with whether or not we're able to trust in him. And, and so one of the things that we try to do at Encounter is we try to kind of distill what the Holy Spirit has revealed to us in Scripture and in through what he's doing in the church so that we instill that into all of us so that we can trust in him. Because if we don't trust in him, what begins to happen? We begin to try to focus on ourselves. We begin to try to do it ourselves. We begin to see that the promises of God are beyond our reach. And we begin to grow in fear. And we live in fear, not able to bear the fruit that Jesus won for us. Or, or bear the fruit that he, he's given to us by victory by the victory of he's given to us on the cross. And so as a result, we've seen the church begin to be less than who she said she is. And so trusting in God is everything. It's not just, beyond, it's not just the thing that we, um, that we kind of utilize to draw from God his strength for evangelization. It's actually how we are in intimate relationship with him. Without trust, we'll never fall in love with him. And so what I want to do this, this evening is to just kind of dispel some kind of myths about what trust is and then give a kind of a three-step process of actually growing in trust. And, and for most of you, you'll recognize this is a very relational process because there is no trust without relationship. In fact, trust is formed by virtue of that relationship. It's not something we can do on our own. So on the outset, first of all, I just want to say it's okay to struggle with trust. Say to your neighbor, it's okay to struggle trusting. <laughs> All right. How many of you have experienced just being kind of a nervous wreck, fearful, insecure, and just not able to trust at times? How many of you have experienced that? All right. Okay, so that's all of us, right? And the reason why I think this is important to say at the outset is that we need to, to recognize that this is where we are found. This is where God finds us. God finds us in the midst of our fear. He finds us in the midst of our insecurities. And that's where he loves us. It's important for us to recognize this because as sometimes we recognize our lack of trust. The temptation is to, to kind of recriminate. The temptation is to judge. The tempta temptation is to reject ourselves in it. But it's actually, the, that's, that's the very opposite of what we should be doing. 
rather than actually being hard on ourselves and we find ourselves lack of trusting, we want to give ourselves over to the Lord so that he can love us in that because that's what produces the trust in us. To put it a different way, the foundation of trust is receiving love from Jesus. That's what it means, and that's how, what, what I'm going to be talking about tonight, is receiving love from Jesus. So I'm going to talk about three um, kind of step process, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to end with just one exhortation before we get into an activation. So the first thing I, I want to just encourage all of you to remember is that when we approach God, we have to approach him in faith according to how he reveals himself. That when we're trusting in God, we're seeking to approach him in a relationship, we have to approach him in the way that he reveals ourselves. Because one of the biggest mistakes we can make in our relationship with God is to approach him as he's not. To confuse him perhaps with other images of God that people have projected onto us or perhaps what we projected onto him. In other words, we come to God as he reveals himself in sacred scripture. God is not an absent father. God is not a, a demanding father. He's overly demanding. He's not a, a jealous husband in, a, in, a, in the worst sense of it, right? He is a loving father, a good God, right? He himself is not a manipulator. He's here to give himself to us. In fact, God doesn't really want, want much from us. He just wants us. He wants to give us everything. And so when we approach him, we make sure that we're, we're not um, approaching a God who's like, he's a control freak and demeaning and he's taking away our freedom. He's a God who is in love with us. And, and that means taking seriously what God says to us in scripture about who he is. Right? Jesus is the perfect image of God. If we want to know who Jesus is, I'm sorry, we don't know who God is, we just need to look at Jesus. Who does Jesus reveal God to be? A loving father. Right? He gives us the parable of the good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son. He tells us that we don't need to worry about anything because he's given us everything that we need. Right? He's the one that, who cares for the leper, who cares for those who are sick. Right? He heals them. He delivers people from evil. The one who promises that if we believe in him, not only will he destroy death for us, but we will live with him forever. And this is a God who's pure mercy, who's pure love, he's pure compassion. This is how we image God when we pray to him. I cannot tell you how important this is because when we pray and we close our eyes, if we don't have an image of who God really is, then it's gonna be very difficult to trust in him. One of the things that I find as a priest is that we can, if we're not aware of it, we can project onto God our false images of who he is or perhaps the things or the, the ways in which he was kind of imaged to us when we were growing up. All of us have parents that were imperfect. And because we've had imperfect parents, it's easy for us to, to kind of look at God through the lens of how they imaged or imaged him, which is going to be a broken image in one way or another. The way that it's supposed to work is that when we're parenting, we're seeking to help the child you know, kind of have a relationship with God, to recognize that he's far better than we are, but we're, we want to reflect him in some way or another. But some of us didn't grow up with the best parents. And so if we're not careful, we can project onto God that kind of, of who he is. And that can really rob us of our relationship with him. The reason why I'm, I'm saying this so much is because um, this is perhaps one of the biggest reasons why we don't trust him is because we don't really believe that he is good as he reveals himself in scripture. And so we need to allow that scripture forms us rather than, or kind of scripture forms the way that we think rather than the way that we think form our understanding of scripture. That difference is huge. One kind of image of God I want to uh, just kind of give to you is the image of Jesus as being love. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 is describing what love is. And you can replace that what he's saying about love with Jesus. And you can do it with great accuracy theologically, right? So when Paul says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, not pompous, I'm going to replace all those with Jesus. I want you to listen to what kind of God that we're praying to. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. He's not jealous. He's not pompous. 
He's not inflated. He's not rude. He does not seek his own interests. He is not quick-tempered. He does not brood over injury. He does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Jesus never fails. This is the kind of God that wants us to love him. And, I, and I'm, I'm convinced that when we understand, when we go to pray, that we're imagining that kind of God, what begins to happen is that the walls of our hearts begin to come down. We begin to recognize that perhaps our fear is, is not so much of what, what we're going through, but our fear is whether or not we can depend on him. And we can't really love a God we don't know. We can't know a God we don't love. And we certainly can't trust in a God that we don't believe is good. And so the most important part is for us to be to, to kind of like eating a, sacred, a, a, a consistent diet of sacred scripture, consuming a, a, the revelation of who God is. Oftentimes when I run across people who uh, do not trust God very well or have a very hard time with it, they have a very skewed vision of who God is. And so I just want to encourage you just to make sure that, that when you're approaching God, approach him as he is, as the beloved Savior, the Redeemer, the one who comes into the depths of your sorrow, your brokenness, and your sin, and who loves you right there. Because that will help you to open up your heart to him. So that's my, that's my first exhortation. The second is when you approach him, is make simple acts of faith in his love for you. You see, in the scriptures and, in, and, and throughout the church, Jesus reveals himself as one who loves us through everything, who loves us to the end, who holds nothing back. And so we don't have to have our life figured out. We don't have to have a perfect ability to love him in response. All he wants is, is our faith. He wants us to believe what he says to us is true, that he loves us. So when we come to prayer, what we do is we simply say, Jesus, I believe in your love for me. I believe you're loving me right now. Because that actually positions us to receive from him what he wants to give to us. Now the temptation is that some of you might be thinking, Father, this is very simple. And I'm saying, yes, exactly right. This is very, very simple. It's very, very important for us to position ourselves as a little child before him. Jesus says, unless you become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. What does it mean to approach Jesus as a child or, or to approach the Father as a child? That means to approach him with utter dependency on him, as if everything you need is coming from him. And, and he wants to give you everything that you need. It's approaching him with, with great trust that, that God is going to give to you everything that you need. So to approach him as a child is to, is to lack this desire to kind of provide for yourself, this desire to kind of protect yourself, the desire to have to figure it out. It means letting all that go and trusting in him that he is going to love you the way that you are and not the way that you want to be. And this is important. When we approach as children, we don't pretend to be someone else. We come as we are and he loves us in that. And what that does is that opens up our hearts to receive all that he has for us. And so there are a few things that I think have helped me when coming to God to trust him. Before anything that I struggle with trust, any situation or any difficulty or relationship or whatever, I, it's like I enter into prayer recognizing that he is my loving father and I am his beloved son. That Jesus is my loving savior and I am his beloved redeemed. Right? That the Holy Spirit is my God, the giver of life, the Lord, the giver of life. And I am his temple and he dwells in me. He delights to be with me. And so with that in my mind, I enter into prayer with great acts, with, with great kind of awareness of who he is. I come to recognize who I, who I am in him. And so some of the things I like to do is I like to imagine sometimes, and this, this may apply to some of you more than others, um, if God is really this loving, if he really is this passionately in love with us, that he's willing to suffer on the cross, to take our sin and our death upon himself, then I can come to him as a child when I'm afraid, 
when I'm worried, when I'm, I feel guilty, when I'm ashamed, and I can just run into his arms because he loves me. One of my favorite images of trust and faith is jumping into the arms of someone you love. Think about someone that you trust. When you're hurt, when you feel broken, you feel helpless, you're struggling, and that person is in front of you with their arms wide, and they want to embrace you. That is a place of intimacy. That's a place of presence. That's a place of, of great joy. That's a place of comfort. And so the same kind of thing can happen with us when, we're, when we approach God. If we approach God as a, as a little child, we can run into his arms. We can cry on his shoulder. We can give to him all of our sorrow. We can just let it out. And we can allow him to embrace us. I can tell you it's very difficult to not come to God when we picture God like that. It's very difficult for us to think that he's going to reject us if we recognize, no, we are his little, we are his little ones. In fact, he's eternally accepted us in his son Jesus. Right, so we can come to him with great confidence as little children and jump into his arms. In fact, for some of us, that's how we're going to grow in trust the most, is just allowing him to hold us. Again, for some of you, this probably doesn't speak that, that much to you, but for, but, but for other, others, this is precisely where God wants you to be. It's allowing him to hold you, allowing him to tell you that it's going to be okay, allowing him to speak his compassion to you and his forgiveness and his mercy. The other thing I find that can be helpful approaching God in, in just great childlike trust is, is approaching him and allowing him to gaze upon you. Now this might make some of us feel uncomfortable. But this is what the peasant said to the curé of ours when he was praying in the church. He was constantly praying. And St. John Vianney, who's a curé of ours, he said, so how, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm praying. Well, tell me about your prayer. He says, I look at him and he looks at me. It's just very simple intimacy. Because the temptation, when we're, when we're afraid, the temptation is to kind of wiggle about, to not sit still, to try to do something to make ourselves feel better, to distract ourselves, right? That's what we tend to do. But what if we were just to simply say, Jesus, I give you permission to love me and just look at him look at you. How he gazes upon you, how he delights in you, Right? Because what that begins to do is it begins to bring to the surface all the different lies that we believe about ourselves and we bring them to the gaze of God and his gaze is so strong it pierces right through that. That he loves me when I feel unlovable. That he's delighting in me even when I feel out of control. I feel I don't know what to do with my life. You see, sometimes it's just sitting in the gaze of God as a, as a child and letting him love you is, is exactly what you need to unlock that, that, that gift of trust to say, okay, Lord, I trust in you. The other thing I like to do sometimes when I am, I'm kind of feeling a little um, discombobulated or a little um, kind of scattered, I say, Lord, how are you loving me right now? This is one of my favorite. I mean, think about it this way. In faith, we believe that we're being held into existence by the eternal God. Right now, you're being held into existence. If you were to stop loving you, you would cease to exist. If that's true, he's constantly loving you. There's never a time in which he's not loving you. Which means all we have to do to be, to kind of take our eyes off of ourselves, which is the number one recipe for lack of trust, is to focus on ourselves, is to say, Lord, how are you loving me right now? Opening your mind to his revelation. How are you loving me right now? And sometimes the Lord will give you an impression. He'll give you an image or a word of, of sharing how is it that he's loving you. Maybe it's how he's providing for you. Like these are very simple things. He might remind you of something that happened in the day, earlier in the day. He might remind you of something that someone that, who loves you said to you. He might show you perhaps how he's holding you or maybe show you what he's doing for you in the, the particular situation. But regardless, you're approaching and you're saying, Lord, how are you loving me right now? What does it do is it takes your eyes off yourself and you receive what he has for you. And it's incredible what happens. The other thing that I like to do is, is just to tell him, Lord, I can't wait to see how you provide for me in this situation. That's a pretty bold prayer. Because what is the lack of trust and the temptation is? That God's, God's not trustworthy. He's not going to provide for you. You're on your own. You've got to do this yourself. 
You got to figure it out. But the reality is, is Lord, I, I can't wait to see how you, how you provide for me. Or when something evil happens, Lord, I can't wait to see how you're going to bring good out of this. I mean, the most evil thing in the history of the world happened here. And the most profound, extraordinary good that um, God brought out of this was through the forgiveness of our sins and, and giving us divine life, sharing with him his divine life. Like to, to look at the cross and say, Lord, I, didn't, I would not have known how you were going to bring good out of that, but I know that you did. And I, I can look at the worst sufferings in my life and say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I look forward to you showing me how you're going to bring good out of this. That itself is an act of faith that positions you to receive what God wants to show you. The last thing I, I love to do is, um, is just asking the Lord, how do you want me to respond to this? There's sometimes situations that are so confusing, so difficult, and so trying that we can feel overwhelmed by the whole thing and we can just shut down. Does anyone else experience that? We just kind of shut down? There's a few honest people in here. I appreciate it. I'm just kidding. Um, Lord, how do you want me to respond? How are you asking me to respond to your love right now? How are you asking me to love this person? How are you asking me to be there for this person? Just simply giving him an opportunity to speak into your heart. See, one of the things that, reasons that why this, this helps us grow in trust is that it puts us in a position of receiving from him. None of these things make any sense if God is not loving us. None of these make any sense if God is not a good father. None of these make any sense if Jesus is not a loving savior who gives us everything that we need. But when we position ourselves in faith and lift our hearts up in these little ways, we, we, we receive from him, which changes everything in every situation. And finally, so the first step is approach God as he's revealed himself, right? And Jesus is the perfect image of God. Second is to make acts of faith in his love for you. And the key is to embrace your littleness as a child and approach him as a child. And number three, Share with Jesus the fear points you have in your life and allow him to love you in them. Share with Jesus the fear points you have in your life and allow him to love you in them. This is extraordinarily important because we tend to think that to grow in trust, we just need to try harder. I just can't trust God. I just got to keep trying. I got I to keep just like, like kind of like white knuckling it. Right? When there's a difficult situation in your life or something you're afraid of or a situation, maybe you fear what people, are, what people think of you or whatever, we just feel like we just need to try harder. And so a lot of times when we can't trust, we're, we're finding ourselves focusing so much on what we're capable of doing or lack thereof and we can get frustrated. But the truth is that, that growing in trust is less about trying harder than it is about allowing him to love us. That's the only thing that has ever worked. Because without him, we can do, do we know that passage? Without him, we can do nothing. We can't do anything without him. So if we can't do anything without him, what are we trying to do without him? We're not trusting everything. But when we're trusting, we're, we're, we're allowing him to do it. So one of the things that, that sometimes um, happens is people say, Father, I have a hard time trusting. And I'm just, I can't, I can't trust. And I'll say, well, what are, you, what are you afraid of? Like, what do you mean? I'm just afraid that God's not going to provide. What, what, are you, what are you afraid that he's not going to provide? Like, well, I'm just about the future. So, well, what about the future are you afraid of? And I keep asking these questions. So what I'm trying to do is I have them name their fears. Name the fears. Name the places of insecurity. Name, name the, the, the hopelessness. Name it so that you can actually present it to him. You see, we can't, we can't just pr pretend that somehow we're going to trust God if we just have more willpower. The fact is, we're, we're only going to trust God when we know his goodness and his love and his presence in the midst of where we don't know it. So we have to lift up to him. You see, prayer is actually something that we need. Like, if we don't believe he's going to provide for us in a particular situation or relationship, how are we going to know that he's going to provide for us unless we talk to him about it? Unless we bring it to him? And sometimes our prayers are so vague and abstract that they never actually, we're never actually bringing to him the place of pain. We're not bringing him the place of confusion. 
We're just kind of throwing it up there. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is we need to actually bring the fear points and name them and bring them up to him. Lord, I'm afraid that if I become a priest, I'm going to be unhappy because I've always wanted to be a husband and a father. I'm afraid that I'm not going to have the love that I desperately want. See how clear that is? Instead of, Lord, I'm afraid of becoming a priest. No, Lord, this is actually what I'm afraid of, Lord. I'm afraid that you're not going to be enough for me. Or maybe someone who's, who's thinking about a job change. I'm afraid that if I don't get this job, or if I change job, that I'm not going to do good at this job, and I'm going to be a failure, and my wife isn't going to look down on me. Like, I'm very, very afraid that I'm going to be a failure in this. What, so what you're doing is you're acknowledging the fear, and you're bringing that up to the Lord, and then what you're doing is allowing him to speak into it so that he can actually tell you the truth. Because when he communicates his truth to you in the midst of your fear, then you have confidence that he's going to provide for you. Then you have confidence that he's there with you, and you don't have to bear the pain alone. This is so incredibly powerful. Because one of the things, before I give some examples, some more examples, I just God delights to be with you in your pain. He delights to be with you in your need. That's actually who he is to us, right? We, we, everything we have is we need, we need him. And the more we get in touch with our need and are honest with him about it, the more we actually can draw from him. This is the great paradox of the Christian life, and this is, only makes sense if God is love. But because he is love, this is the way that we can actually grow in trust in our relationship with him. So let me give you a few examples um, of just how this has worked in my life, just to kind of flesh things out and kind of draw a couple kind of like lessons from them. When I first got here at the parish, um, there was a specific guy who was very critical of me. Um, he's, not, he's no longer part of the parish. He's very, very critical of me. Um, and I didn't kick him out, right? Just so he, <laughs> he left on his own accord. Um, but he was very critical of me. In fact, there, there are very few things that I did that he did not try to criticize. And at one point, I, I remember like, just having all this fear of how he's going to respond to a decision I had to make. And there was all this fear that was there. And I didn't want to do anything that would make him to be upset. Anyone else have that experience of someone who, who gets upset at something you do and that sometimes can control your life? Right? Okay, so, so I was afraid. I didn't trust to do the right thing. So I'm like, I'm like praying through this. I can't control this guy. And um, I just remember like praying, Lord, I don't know what to do. And I just heard him say, as I'm pouring out my heart, is he free to respond the way he wants to whatever you do? I'm like, well, yeah, it's okay. Let him respond however he wants. And immediately I knew this was not my responsibility at all. How he responded to how I lived and what I did and the decisions I make was not my responsibility. And at, from that moment, I was completely free. It wasn't as if I didn't care how, I, how he felt. It was more of a, it wasn't my responsibility. If he wanted to reject what I was offering in terms of pastoring the parish, that's not on me, that's on him. And that, was, that freed me. So what do you think that did? That actually helped me trust in God. That helped, helped me to, to lean into what he wanted me to do. Right? It, it's amazing how that little thing, but that never would have happened if I would have held back from Jesus. I would not have told him all the pain and the, and the real fears. So that's just one example. Um, another example is um, sometimes I love to um, win people over. That's one of my strengths in the strengths finders. And sometimes I can't win everybody over because I can't control them. Um, some of you guys realize you are, <laughs> and I'm not really that good at doing it. Um, and so again, like this, 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 this fear, like I, I'm not able to win everybody over. And, and like honestly, people aren't following what I'm saying as a, as a pastor. People are, are just kind of doing their own thing. They're not interested. And that really hurt me. Um, and I, I just remember ca- crying out to the Lord about it. It's like, Lord, it's just hard for me to trust that, that what you're saying to me or, or what you're calling me to do is something I can do because I don't know how I'm going to do that because people are people you know, X, Y, and Z, because I'm not able to win people over. So here I am, like, crying out to the Lord, right? This is actually my prayer, giving you a little insight, right? But I just remember, um, as I'm, I'm, I'm praying through this, one of my priest friends was praying with me, and he just said to me, I just said to the Lord, is saying that my sheep hear my voice. 
Meaning like, your sheep hear your voice. They hear it very, very well. And some people perhaps are not choosing to follow you as a shepherd. Now again, this does not in any way absolve me from, from bad leadership. But what this did is again, it helped me to realize that, that my responsibility is to love the sheep and to pasture them well. I can't control how people respond to my leadership. Now, but some of you like, might be thinking, this is very basic stuff. I'm telling you, this is profound in my life. This is profound, and I learn these kinds of lessons through prayer all of the time. And one of the things I often sometimes will say in the Encounter School of Ministry, I, I give a lot of examples, but one day I was just pouring out my heart about all my, my insecurities, and, and I remember the Lord said, just, he just stopped and he says, your insecurities are not your responsibility. <laughs> what? They're not? <laughs> It was literally the most liberating moment of my life. It was so awesome. But anyway, so I, I give you these examples because I've grown so much in this and all that is is just bringing up to the surface the areas of pain, the areas of fear, right? I, I'll give you, um, let, me just, let me just talk a little bit more about that responsibility. So it's oftentimes parents have a hard time trusting God with their children, especially when they go off to college or when they're making a decision that might be a terrible decision, right? Parents want their children to make good decisions. And it's the same kind of thing. We can't control people, and yet we want to, right? We want to prevent them from making a mistake, but we know that that's not love, that's not, that's not good parenting, we have to let them go, right? It's a very similar thing. One of the reasons why we don't trust God is because we're taking upon ourselves responsibilities that aren't ours. Like, it's not our responsibility to make decisions for people, right? And we have to let people go to make those kind of decisions. And so sometimes I, I pray with people, and there's, there's like a fear of letting go, or there's like deep worry and fear about loved ones. And when, sometimes when I pray with them, I, just, I, I help them imagine Jesus standing in front of them, and I just have them guide their loved ones to Jesus. And I say, look at Jesus and say, Lord, I give them to you. And pay attention to what comes up in your heart. If there's a resistance to that, you want to ask him, Lord, what burden am I carrying that, you don't, that you're not asking me to carry? What burden am I carrying regarding this person you're not asking me to carry? And oftentimes people say, like, well, their happiness, their joy, and all this other, and they'll say their joy, their happiness, their freedom, their safety. Jesus will reveal that to them. And so I'll just say, would you give those burdens to Jesus? Because he's never asked you to carry all of that by yourself. And they give the burdens to Jesus, they give their children to Jesus, and they're able to be free. And say, Jesus, what burden, do you, what, what blessing, what do you want to give to me in place of these burdens? And usually it's like freedom, love, and confidence. You know, the peace of knowing that you've given them to him and you don't have to control them anymore. Right? So this is an extraordinarily powerful thing that can happen in people's lives. But it will never happen unless we're fully acknowledging what the fear points are. What's the fear point? Why can't I let go of this situation? Why can't I let go of this relationship? Why can't I trust in this situation? We have to really, really be radically honest with him and give those to him. One of the things, too, is that Jesus wants to help us bring our, sometimes our past wounds to him so they can heal our hearts. Some of you may have heard this story, but I, I can't tell, tell you how powerful this was for me when I was in seminary. There was a, a woman, as a professor, who was telling us about what inner healing prayer was. And she says, just one time in your prayer, how about you to ask Jesus to, to show you where he wants to heal your heart? And when he shows you, uh, I want you to bring Jesus into that memory and ask him to show his truth to you and to reveal himself to you there. I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird, you know. Um, <laughs> I didn't say weird. I wanted to, but I was also like, it's that simple? Like what? And uh, so I, I remember I was praying, so, okay, Lord, um, where do you want to heal my heart? And immediately I had an image of me being at the casket of one of my friends who died in a car accident um, uh, probably five years before. I hadn't thought of that in years but guess what I felt when I saw the memory of me being at his casket? All this pain in my, and I felt like, oh my goodness, it's like someone punched me in the stomach. Now what do we typically do? 
We just avoid that. Nope, that was done. I, I got to move on. I, I got to take care of this. But she's like, no, actually, Jesus wants to love us there. He wants to, to love and heal. That's what he's capable of doing. And so it's like, I am not going back there. And I think maybe some of us have memories that we just do not want to go back to. But what if Jesus wants actually to love us there? What if he wants to restore our hearts? What if he's not only wanting to, but he's inviting us to? So I said, oh, okay. So I remember I'm, I'm sitting there and I, I begin to feel what I felt. Now this was a particularly difficult thing for me because I was so in denial. It was, it was just so painful because I was just spending the night with him or um, the evening before um, with a bunch of friends who were watching the Super Bowl and he went to go back to college at his university. I went back to my university. And the roads were terrible. And what had happened was he was T-boned and was killed in a car accident. We had just celebrated the Super Bowl the night before. And I got the call in the morning. And I was like in so much pain. In fact, people were worrying about me because I was in so much pain. When I got to the casket, what ended up happening was I collapsed on the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. It was one of the most painful experiences of my entire life up to that point. And it's the very thing that Jesus said he wanted to heal. So what I did is that I, I just said, okay, Lord, come. And I felt the pain and I'm crying at the casket. I see this image, I'm back in the memory. I'm crying and I look over to my left and I see Jesus there crying with me. He's looking, he's tears flowing down his face, looking at my, my friend. And he says, behold, I make all things new. And all the pain vanished. I'm like, what? You make all things new? This is not the end? Like, 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 and all that like pain is like, I make all things new. And from that moment, that, that, that actual memory is no longer painful. It's actually a place of joy. It's a place of anticipation. It's a place of, oh yeah, here my king and my God showed himself to me there. He loved me there. He's powerful there. And if he can do that in, in, my, in, in my life there, what else can he do in different areas of my heart? What about the people that are broken that are on the streets doing drugs? What about the family members that can't trust each other because they're so wounded? What about the destruction that overwhelms the family in our society? Maybe God can do something about their pain. So what began to happen was I began to see that, that Jesus is capable of dealing with my pain. He's capable of renewing, making all things new. Do you think that helped me trust him with my other pains, right? This radically increased my trust because I, for whatever reason, was taught to, uh, to ask Jesus to come into the area of pain and reveal himself there. This is the kind of thing that Jesus loves to do because he wants us to recognize that he's not against us. He's for us. When I was in the hospital, when I was suffering from my, my strange situation, I don't even know how, what do I call it? Like, I don't know, like, you know, complication for surgery, blood clot, sepsis. I mean, I, what do I call it? I don't know. I was just, it was very bad. Um, at one point, I was in the hospital, and I had this thing happen where, where basically um, my kidney exploded out the back. It was so much pressure, the stent moved, it exploded my kidney, it perforated back, and I kind of exploded out into my my abdomen there area, area, and it was extremely painful. Anyone who's had kidney stones knows exactly what I'm talking about. Well, this was happening, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs with all the Dilaudid, which is, I think, even more powerful than morphine, all the Dilaudid in my heart, or in my body. Um, I was screaming, I was thrashing around, I was hyperventilating, I was in so much pain, and I literally thought I was gonna have a mental breakdown. Because I, 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 it wasn't like, I thought I was going to have a mental breakdown. It was so bad. Um, it got to the point where was, I was, that was so um, traumatic for me that I was, I got like a little PTSD from it. Um, because I was afraid that this was going to happen again. So here I am in the hospital, freaking out. Um, it wasn't until after I was out of the hospital that I realized I had to actually be with Jesus there. Um, it was actually a really powerful moment. Um, I, I was praying for the conversion of the world when I was doing this, which is an incredible grace as it is. Um, not going to get into all of that, but um, I, was, I was in so much pain when I went back to the memory that I started shuddering. So 
I went back anyway. Because I know Jesus can do this. I don't want to live in trauma. I want to live in freedom. So I brought Jesus with me. And I, or not Jesus with me. I just said, Jesus, come and show me what you were doing in this moment. Show me what you wanted me to know. Just come and be with me in this moment. And I'm experiencing this. And again, this fear that I'm going to have a mental breakdown. If anyone's had extreme pain, you feel like you're just going to, you're going to lose it. That's kind of what I was experiencing. And I remember him coming. Um, he was in the corner of the room. And he was just looking at me. And to believe it or not, that was actually really powerful. Okay, he's here with me. And I, and I was able to do this a little bit when I was actually in the moment. I definitely sensed he was with me, but I didn't hear him say anything. We didn't do anything. But when I went back, he looks at me and he says, you can do this. And I have no idea why he said that at the, po- at the moment. And I have no idea why that was so helpful for me. In fact, when he said that, almost all of my pain went away. You can do this. Like, he had more confidence in me than I ever had in myself, right? He's like, you can do this. And what that began to do for me is it began to help me to understand how is it that Jesus is present in my life in the particular points of suffering. He's not worried. He's not anxious. He actually, if we're going through suffering, it's not because he's willing the suffering, but he definitely thinks that we can handle it. That's crazy to me. But that helped me to trust him even more. I'll give you another example. Um, I hope some of these examples are helpful. I I remember one time there was um, an election. And the people that I wanted to win did not actually get elected. (laughs) Has anyone ever experienced anything like that? (laughs) Um, Well, one time I was uh, was honestly pouring out my heart to the Lord. And I was angry. Um, And again, if you're angry, just give it to him. Don't hold on to it. Give it to him. He can handle it. But talk to him about the pain underneath the anger. That's what he wants to get to. So I was, I was pouring my heart out, and I, at one point I'm like, don't you care? And he says, I, I, I don't know, I was not expecting this. I remember exactly where I was. By the way, I wasn't here. It's a different election. Um, <laughs> that's what you're like, what? I'm like, don't you care? And I heard immediately, of course I do, but not as much as you think. And then he says, my plan is to pour out my spirit upon my church that it might bear witness to me all the more. Wow. That completely shifted my heart. It completely shifted my mindset. So God is actually about something that I was not about. Go figure, right? <laughs> he's, he's doing something that we don't quite understand. Go figure, right? He's allowing something that we wouldn't ever allow. We look at the early church, what's happening, right? You, you imagine the early church struggling with the fact that, wait, wait a second, why, is, why, why are you allowing the emperor to kill us? What's going on? But the church filled with the Holy Spirit was about the work of the Holy Spirit, which is preaching conversion in the name of Jesus, preaching that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's risen from the dead, that in him we have hope. There's no emperor that could do anything about that. You can't, even, you can't chain the word of God, as Paul says. You see, what happens is when we pour our heart out to God, we give God the capacity to give us his perspective, which enables us to trust in what otherwise wouldn't have been a trustworthy thing. It would have been difficult to trust in. And there are situations in our life that we might find be very, very difficult. But when we bring those things to him, we say, and we, we cry out to him, that's when he gives us his revelation. He gives us his presence. He gives us his peace which enables us to live differently. You see, that's how trust is born. It's not of us just kind of thinking our way through things. We need to allow him to think in us and with us, to show us his love. See, the key is is that even though whatever, the key is is that whatever you're going through, name the fear Name the thing and present it as a child to him. And allow him to be with you in it. I know that sounds overly simplistic, but that's honestly why it's so powerful. This kind of prayer, this kind of trust to growing it, it actually eludes people who think that it's more complicated than that. They think that we can just kind of read our way to, pre- read our way to peace, or study our way to peace. If I just, just give me a, give me a formula, Father, 
right, and what, that I can grow in trust. No, it's actually a relationship. Before I conclude, I just want to add one final point. This is not one of the steps. This is just a final point. Um, spend time with people who trust in God. Spend time with people who are trying to trust in God. Like, there's studies that talk about how we tend to reflect the very people we spend time with. Right? If we spend time with people who are joyful, spend time with people who are hopeful, who make good decisions, we're more likely to be hopeful, joyful, and make good decisions. But if we spend time with people who, who have a, either a hard time trusting God, but really are just given to cynicism, and given to negativity, and given to fear-based thinking, what might happen to us? We might become more cynical, right? We might become more negative. We might become like someone who gives into fear-based thinking. I mean, this is really, really important because if we really want to trust in God, we have to be a part of a community of people who are trying to trust in God. We need to actually pray with each other, to encourage each other. This is actually one of the purposes of the prophetic gifts is to encourage each other because there's a lot of negativity out there. To, to translate it for some of you, it's like, if you want to actually enjoy life and trust in God, do not watch the news all the time. <laughs> like, come on, right? Or at least watch it with God sitting next to you and having him tell you what's going on, right? Um, right? So this is really important. Like, we can't, like, again, I'm not to say, if you have someone in your life that's cynical, that's, that's negative thinking, and is, is struggling with fear-based thinking, and you're actually called to love that person, I'm not saying don't spend time with that person. What I'm saying is be careful how you allow that person to influence the way you think and the way that you see the world. Because there's a lot of darkness in the world. And it's very easy for us, especially if we have kind of issues with trust in ourselves, to point to the darkness as reasons why we'll never trust God. Or to point to the darkness and say, this is what the devil's doing. After a while, we'll find ourselves paying more, pen more attention to what the devil's doing than what God is doing. And we'll never trust God if we're only looking at the devil. See, it's, it's who is it that we're allowing, who is it that we're trusting and that it is sometimes determined by the people around us. Like, I'm very happy that Patrick's one of my best friends. He's a very, very bold, faithful, confident person. Right? He, he, like, really, serious. Like, I mean, he, he, he and I, we, we build each other up. We give each other hope. We say, well, hey, Lord, what is it that you're doing? We see what the devil's accomplished. But what are you doing, Lord? Right? There, there may or may not be blogs and people in the Catholic world who for, for whatever's happening, the world is like, the sky is falling all the time. And they, 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 their, their reports, the way they speak, the way they, they kind of convey information actually incites fear in people who read them and watch them. That's not a very good idea. And again, it's not to say that we can't actually be realists and confront and acknowledge real problems. In fact, we have to acknowledge and confront real problems, but we don't have to allow that to set the frame of mind by which we understand what God is up to. And I happen to believe that God is up to a lot in the church right now of purifying his bride, of, of renewing us, of, kind of, of, of making her, her beautiful and holy. But we have to have eyes of faith to see that. But if we're surrounding ourselves with people who are always cynical and negative and fall into fear-based thinking, we're actually not going to get to that place of trust. My brothers and sisters, it's not a coincidence that the people who trust God the most and are most joyful have other friends who trust in God and are most joyful and are, and are joyful. This is not rocket science, but we need to really be serious about Choosing who we actually allow to influence our hearts and our minds. So the, this evening I, I, I spoke a little bit about trust. And I hope this was helpful for you. Um, does anyone want to pray? Do an activation? All right. So I want you to uh, just get into a prayer posture and close your eyes. I'm just going to acknowledge his presence. And just remember that we're in the presence of our God who's loving us right now.
Maybe it'll help you just to allow to gaze upon you, allow him to gaze upon you. Jesus, I believe in your love for me. Jesus, I believe that you're with me and that you'll never leave. Just allow him to love you right now. make little acts of faith. Jesus, I believe you make all things new. I believe that you delight in me. I believe that I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to control. I don't have to grasp for what I need. I just want you to pay attention to your mind. What comes to you when we ask Jesus this question? It could be a word or it could be an image. It could be just a thought or maybe even just a sense but I believe Jesus wants to unburden us tonight with false responsibilities that we often struggle with that prevent us from trusting in God. So I want you to just out loud to repeat after me this little prayer. Jesus, what burdens am I carrying? that you do not want me to carry. Just radically acknowledge or honestly acknowledge what's coming to your mind. Sometimes we carry burdens of responsibility or we carry people in our hearts in a way that makes us feel like we got to do more than God is asking us to do. What burdens am I carrying that you do not want me to carry? And what I want you to do just one by one, the things that come up in, that came up in your mind. So Jesus, I give this burden to you. I give this one to you. I just give this to you, Lord. I just give this to you, Lord. Just one by one, just give them to Jesus. So the way that we let go of these burdens is that we ask Jesus to give to us something to replace them. He doesn't just want us to let go, he wants us to hold on to him and what he has for us. So I want you to repeat this little prayer after me and pay attention to what comes to you. Jesus, what do you want to give to me in place of these burdens? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And whatever's coming up in your mind, 
Say, Jesus, I receive. I receive this from you. Thank you for this gift. Holy. What do you want to give to me in place of these burdens? Holy, 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 holy. Holy, holy Lord. Holy Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, Lord. Jesus, we repent. We're trying to carry responsibility and carry the heaviness of having to do it ourselves. You said, come to me all you who labor and are burdened and I will give you rest. So Lord, we thank you for the rest in this moment right now of having given to you what you've never asked us to carry. We thank you for the grace of knowing who you are, that you provide everything that we need, that we're not alone, that we're good and that you delight in us. That with you there is hope let's worship you lord i just want to encourage all of us at this moment just to thank god thank you lord for taking our burdens upon yourself thank you for showing us that we don't have to carry what we often think we have to carry we don't have to rely on ourselves that you will defend us, you will provide for us, that you tend to our emotions, that you have a plan for our life. That you bring good out of evil. We thank you, Lord. Just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Holy, holy, holy. We thank you for making us your beloved children, Father, that we can approach you with great trust, with our hearts that have been broken. We can approach you in our fear. We can approach you in our neediness. We can approach you for strength when we feel weak. We thank you for giving us everything we need so that we can be who you've made us to be, who you've redeemed us to be. That if you are for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us, Lord? You are holy, holy, holy. Or how many people, if you just raise your hand, found that, that prayer to be like really helpful for you? <laughs> Praise God. I'm just really grateful for what the Lord is doing. And uh, I'm going to invite up my positive friend, Patrick, to come forward. <laughs> so, good. so good. Thank you, Jesus. I'd like to thank Father, let's thank Father Matthias again. It's one of those nights where you're like, I feel great, I feel great. And then you're like, whoa, I didn't know why my heart needed that much healing. Wow, God, you're so good. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that's joined us online. We're about to shift into prayer ministry right now. Uh, for all of you online, you really should have come and been here in person so you could add more 
Next time, next time, which will not be for two months. So we will see you in February. Um, once again, uh, December 20th, the 30th, EncounterConference.org. That's our, our next uh, time together. That's our flagship highlight event. We're going to be shifting into prayer ministry time right now. So I'd like only... Thank you so much for joining us for this event. Our hope is that these online events will be fuel for the renewal of your mind and transformation in Christ. We are filled with joy when we see people from around the country and the world encountering the power and love of Jesus in the live streams of our events. This event and all of our live streamed events are financially made possible by the support of our Encounter Partners. An Encounter Partner is passionate about seeing the church empowered to do the works of Jesus and even greater works. And Encounter Ministries, our mission is to unleash the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in the world, and we want you to be a part of it. With a recurring donation as low as $10 per month, not only would you be making these events possible for anyone around the world to attend, but you will also have access to our partner page, which is updated monthly with streaming video and audio content from all the sessions of our past Encounter conferences, training events, and all our transformation nights and select sessions from the Encounter School of Ministry. Lastly, if there is a stirring in your heart to be equipped to demonstrate the love of God through the power of the Holy Spirit in a greater measure, Jesus may be calling you to become a student in our Encounter School of Ministry. In these dynamic weekly courses, you can study in person at one of our on-site campuses across the country or join us remotely in our online campus. We are so honored to be part of your journey with Christ and we look forward to seeing you very soon at the next Encounter event. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 